And today we're going to complete our study of the Father. We've looked at uh, the, re the Father, His relationship concerning creation, angels, the nation Israel, and with His Son, the Lord Jesus. And now, today, the Father's relationship with the believer, with you and me. And then we'll leave that and go to the doctrine of the Bible, what the Bible says about itself, an introduction, introduction to and general statistics in the Bible, and then the, ver the meaning and various method of revelation. We begin now with the Father's relationship to the Christian. I have a 21-fold relationship, and we'll just go through these briefly, and I'll comment as we go along. Number one, the Father foreknew the believer. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. He foreknew the believer. Before the foundation of the world, of course, God knew that the date of your birthday, you would come into the world. He knew when you would accept him as personal Savior. He knows when you're leaving this world by way of the grave or by way of the rapture he foreknew the believer and he predestinated the believer now a lot of people argue were predestination do i believe in predestination you have to believe in predestination and by the way predestination has nothing to do with a sinner getting saved predestination predestination has to do with a christian becoming more like jesus the Bible says, having predestinated us into the adoption of ourself, that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. So he foreknew me, he predestinated me, and then he elected me. And now we could argue about election. I will simply say this, uh, the Armenian has a certain view as to why God elected a group of people before the foundation of the word. Uh, of the world. The Calvinist has another view concerning why God elected a certain group of people before the foundation of the world. And when we come to our study of the doctrine of salvation, we will uh, uh, tangle with these words and probably uh, fight World War III before it's over. But he foreknew us, he predestinated us, he elected us, and then he gave all the elected believers to Christ. Now, I preached in a number of missions uh, in Chicago when I was attending the Moody Bible Institute. And often in a mission uh, building as you would go in were the words of John 6, 37. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Well, I certainly believe that. But I often noted that's not all the sentence. That's the last part of the sentence. John 6, 37 says this. All that the Father giveth me, Jesus said, shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. You came to Jesus because the Father gave you to Jesus in the first place. And then he called the believer. We think of the song, He called me long before I heard before my sinful heart was stirred, but when I took him at his word, by grace he lifted me. He called the believer. I think this has to do with old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. And then he conforms the believer to the image of Christ. God has one supreme goal in the life of the believer, and that is to conform the believer to be more like his blessed son. God the Father is so in love with his son that he wants to populate the entire universe with a group of little Jesuses running around. And that's why we're called Christians, which literally means Christ ones. Again, I think of the song, Earthly pleasures vainly call me, I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me, I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. He conforms the believer to the image of Christ. And then he redeemed the believer. Actually, it was the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all had a part in the redemption 
of the repenting sinner. A little poem I read years ago that said this uh, uh, regarding the subject of salvation and redemption. The Father wrought it. And he thought it up and he, he originated it. The Father wrought it. The Son bought it. Uh, the Spirit taught it. <laughs> the devil fought it. Nicodemus sought it. And thank God, I've got it. But it was the Father that began the steps toward our redemption. He redeemed the believer, and then he justifies and justified the believer at the moment of our salvation. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Now, here's the question. Will we see the Father in heaven? And we'll answer that a little later on when we're going to be talking about prophecy. But a question related to this, does the Father indwell the believer? Will we see him? And does he indwell us right now? We know we are indwelled by the Son, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We know we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Paul said, what know ye not your bodies the temple of the Holy Spirit? But are we indwelled by the Father? Well, let me read John 14, 23 and see what you think. Jesus answered and said unto him, one of the disciples asked him a question, If a man love me, he will keep my words and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Yes, in one sense of the word, the believer is indwelled by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He indwells the believer. He sealed the believer with the Holy Spirit at the moment of our salvation, and that's the promise of redemption. We are sealed until the day of redemption. He keeps the believer. John 10, 29, My Father, which gave them to me, Jesus said, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And some will say, well, that's true, but we can pluck ourselves out. But that's the King James translation. It's literally nothing, nothing is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He keeps the believer. He honors the believer. He blesses the believer. He loves the believer. We teach our kids to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We could also certainly, uh, in addition to that, teach him to sing, the Father loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And we could teach him to sing, the Spirit loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How wonderful it is to know I am loved with an everlasting love by the Father, by the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. He loves the believer. And oh, how uh, I have taken refuge here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 regarding the comfort that God the Father affords to the believer. And the Bible says here that he comforts us, and the more we are suffering, the more we suffer, the more consolation, the more comfort he gives to us uh, in order to help us during our trials and tribulations that later then we will be able, because of the comfort given us by the Father, to comfort others that are going through the same trials and tribulations that we have gone through. He comforts the believer that we may be able to do the same thing for other hurting, suffering saints. He sanctifies the believer. That is to say, he sets the believer apart for the work of the ministry. And he bestows peace upon the believer. Uh, Paul, practically every epistle he wrote, he begins with the words, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He bestows peace upon the believer. And the Bible says that he is glorified when the believer bears fruit. He reveals truth to the believer. That's not to say that we're not to listen to our teachers or study, but basically when it comes right down to it, it is the Father that reveals the precious truths in the Word of God. Remember Simon Peter, Jesus asked uh, the disciples a question, Whom do men say that I am? And they had all kinds of answers. He said, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And wow, he's pretty smart. No. 
because Jesus then said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee. You didn't think about this yourself. But my Father, which is in heaven, he did it. He reveals precious truths. And when I'm reading the Word of God, you're reading the Word of God, and suddenly just something just jumps out and says, Wow, I never saw it that way before. It's the Father that reveals truth to believers. And then he supplies the needs, not all our wants, but the needs of all believers. But here's an amazing thing. He seeks the worship of the believer. God has no needs whatsoever, but he does have desires. And his supreme desire is for believers to worship him. John chapter 4, Jesus told the Samaritan woman, The Father seeketh such to worship him. And here's another one. I've experienced this in Hebrews 12. He chastens the believer. Sometimes he takes us to the woodshed and he turns us across his knee and he just uh, spanks the living daylights out of us. He chastens the believer. And when that happens, instead of uh, moaning and groaning or being angry and, and everything, we ought to rejoice. Why? Because we know that we belong to the Father. Because if we say we belong to the Father and go out and live like the devil and we're not chastened, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, we're not children at all. We're illegitimate boys and girls and men and women because the Father is only going to chasten those who belong to him. And then after this chastisement, he restores the believer. I think in Luke 15, you have the prodigal son coming back to the Father, of course, and that's not an example, not an example of a sinner coming to Jesus. I think it's an example of a backslidden believer coming back because the backslidden believer said, uh, the prodigal son, I will arise and go to my father and say, I have, forg I have sinned, please forgive me. Uh, the son does not, the sinner does not go to his father. The sinner goes to his savior. So this was a picture of a backslidden believer being restored by the father. And then he will someday gather all believers in Christ. He will someday reward all believers. He will someday glorify all believers. And he has prepared a kingdom for believers. Jesus said that someday he will say, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The last session we quoted uh, this beautiful song about the Father, this is my Father's world. The first stanza, and end this session with the second two stanzas. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declares their maker's praise. This is my Father's world. He shines in all its fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not won. Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be won. Well, the doctrine of the Father. And now, the doctrine of the Bible for the next few minutes. What the Bible says about itself. One of the great songs, and we rarely sing this song in the various churches that I uh, am in at least, uh, is written by Haldor Linus, and it's simply titled, The Bible Stands. Begin this session, The Doctrine of the Bible, our remaining minutes here, moments, by quoting from this marvelous song. It has a great melody also. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted. Mid the raging storms of time, its pages burn with the truth eternal, and it glows with the light sublime. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the works of men. Its truth by none ever was refuted, and destroy it they never can. And the chorus goes, the Bible stands, though the hills may, trumble, may t tumble, it will firmly stand. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on its found, firm foundation, for the Bible stands. 
going to look basically at some statistics of the Bible and the one of the great key words in understanding the formation of the Bible. That word is revelation. But here now some statistics. The Old Testament, 39 books, 929 chapters. Uh, the New Testament, 27 books, 260 chapters. Uh, we have the 10 longest books in the Bible. The ten shortest books in the Bible, the longest is the Psalms, the shortest is Third John. The ten Old Testament books most referred to in the New Testament, you can read all this in your notes. The ten New Testament books containing material from the greatest number of Old Testament books, etc., etc. And then later on you have the authors listed of the Bible. Some 40 men and women, perhaps uh, Esther may have written the book of Esther, we don't know. Ruth may have written the book of Ruth. If so, men and women... 40, 32 in the old, 8 in the new, were inspired by God to write the 66 books. Then following that, you have some important B.C. and A.D. biblical dates, beginning with 2165, that's the birth of Abraham, um, and going on through the Old Testament uh, to 95 or 100 A.D., the book of Revelation and the completion of the New Testament. Now, I want to spend the remaining moments here now on the formation of the Bible. God, as you have in your new notes, used three wonderful methods as he carefully carved out that most blessed of all books, the Bible. These three tools of the Trinity are referred to as revelation, inspiration, and illumination. Now, these are all important words, and let me give you a sort of a bottom line, no-nonsense summary of these three great words, revelation, inspiration, and illumination. Revelation from God to man, inspiration from man to paper, illumination from paper to heart. I'll go through that again. Revelation from God to man, man hears that which God wants written. So revelation has to do with the ear. Moses, listen up. Here's what I want you to write down. That's the ear. That's revelation. God revealing truth. Inspiration is from man to paper. Man writes that which God wants written. And that has to do with the hand. So inspiration has to do with God guiding the very hand of Moses as he wrote down what God spoke in his ear. Illumination, though, and that's from paper to heart. Man receives that which God has written. That has to do with the human heart. Revelation from God to man. Illumination from man to paper. I'm sorry, uh, inspiration from man to paper. Illumination from paper to heart. Now, uh, I want to uh, take just a quick overview of this first step, revelation from God to man. God spoke in the ears of men. How did God reveal himself? We know he did. Well, we have uh, some 11 different modes of communication. He often spoke to men through angels. And we read this uh, time again in the Old and New Testament, where the angel of the Lord did and said thus and such. So he used men, he used angels to speak to men. In the book of Hebrews, I think... Uh, the author might have had this in mind, this ministry of angels, when he says that, that uh, angels are the ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. And God used angels often to communicate great truths, to reveal great truths to human beings. And then he spoke sometimes directly <clears throat> through a loud voice. Uh, for example, he spoke directly to Adam in Genesis 3. God says, Adam, he didn't speak through an angel God himself spoke, Adam, where are you? And what have you done? And why have you done it? Etc. And why are you hiding from me? So he spoke through a loud voice. Uh, he spoke to Noah. Later on, Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Build an ark. Take your wife and your three sons and three daughters and enter the ark. He spoke to men on one occasion through a still, small voice in 1 Kings chapter 19. Remember, uh, Elijah heard that. There was a great earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake, a windstorm and a fire, and God was not in those uh, phenomena. But then he spoke. 
as, as I think he sometimes speaks to us today in that still, small voice. He spoke to men through, and he speaks to men, if they'll just listen, through nature. Psalm, 90, uh, Psalm 19, the heavens declare, they reveal the glory of God. <laughs> he spoke to one man through the mouth of a donkey. And uh, that's Numbers 22, and I think that has to be one of the funniest moments in the Bible. And by the way, the guy riding that donkey was a fellow by the name of Balaam, a false prophet. And I'm going to tell you, that donkey had more horse sense than the rider did, and you'll have to read that chapter. It's so it's hilarious, it's pathetic, but it's hilarious. And he spoke to men through dreams. On a number of occasions, God chose this method. And, uh, for example, uh, Jacob received the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant in a dream. And then Solomon received his wisdom in a dream. And then the New Testament, Joseph received three messages in three dreams, assuring him of Mary's purity, commanding him to flee to Egypt, then ordering him to return uh, back to Palestine at the death of King Herod. And then he spoke to men through visions. Uh, the book of Revelation, for example, the entire book was given over in vision fashion. Now, the difference between a dream and a vision, of course, is whether the person's asleep or not. Uh, God revealed certain things to men while they were asleep in dreams. But a vision, they were fully awake, and it just appeared upon the scene, and they saw it. So that's the difference. And then he spoke to men, the Old Testament, through the Urim and the Thummim. Now, we don't know what these two words uh, mean, uh, uh, what they are, they literally mean lights and perfection. Some believe they may have been two red jewels or stones that uh, on the breastplate of the high priest, and maybe they glowed, maybe one uh, a green and one red. So, for example, David asked on one occasion, should I uh, attack the Philistines? And he, uh, he uh, used the Urim and the Thummim, and God answered and said yes. So maybe it was the green light that told him to do that. And he spoke uh, to men through the casting of lots. The last time we hear about that is in Acts 20, Acts chapter 1, when they cast lots and uh, determined who would take the place of Judas. Then he spoke to men through the Old Testament Christophanies. Now, Christophany is the pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ. And I must make this uh, uh, note uh, my, to your attention today. When you read in the, uh, the Old Testament the phrase, the title, the angel of the Lord, almost always it refers to a Christophany, a pre-Bethlehem appearance of the Lord Jesus. And um, that occurs many, many times. I mean, Christ had a tremendous ministry, a very busy ministry before he came to planet Earth. So he often spoke uh, to men through Christophanies. It was the angel of the Lord that wrestled with Jacob. And it was the angel of the Lord that spoke to Moses in a burning bush. It was the angel of the Lord that commissioned Gideon. The angel of the Lord that reassured Joshua. And the angel of the Lord preserved three godly Hebrew men. He spoke in the Old Testament through these Christophanies, pre-Bethlehem appearances of Christ. In the New Testament, he spoke to men through the New Testament incarnation of Jesus himself. That's why Jesus said, <clears throat> if you want to know what the Father thinks, listen to what I think. If you want to know what the Father desires for you, I'll tell you. If you know what's close to the Father's heart, examine my life and my heart, because I represent the Father. That's why Jesus was called the Word, because he was the full manifestation, the declaration of the Father. Well, there are other ways, I'm sure, that, that God revealed himself, but at least these 11 ways revelation took place. The last stanza of that great song that we quoted at the beginning, the doctrine of the Bible, the Bible stands. It says, the Bible stands every test we give it, for its author is divine. By grace alone I expect to live it and to prove, prove it and make it mine. I've got enough time to, another half minute to read the, the third stanza. The Bible stands, and it will forever, when the world has passed away, by revelation it has been given, all its precepts 
I will obey. The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble. It will firmly stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands. <laughs>